Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about a wonderful decade that many of us probably don't remember too well, even though we claim probably from time to time we do, and that is the 1970s. It was an interesting year of disco, one-hit wonders, Richard Nixon, the ending of Vietnam, the beginning of Jimmy Carter, and probably the end of the me decade. Well, at least it would stretch into the early 1980s before that happened. On the program today, we're going to be talking about Hollywood, but not the Hollywood that you're thinking of. It's actually more of a fictional rock band. The book is Hollywood, The Band, A Tale of Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. And our guest joining us today, its author, received his bachelor's degree from California State University. He's also worked in various aspects of the music business and spent a number of years in rock and roll bands as well. He's joining us here on the program to talk about his fictional tale and what it takes for those of us who are looking at things such as The Voice and American Idol wondering, what does it take to get into the music business and be successful? I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Mr. Stephen Brooks. Stephen, thank you for joining us here on the program today. My pleasure. Thanks for letting me have on. Now, it's interesting to note that here you were, you know, in and out of the music business, rock and roll bands. I mean, you you know, that's kind of a, one of those interesting adventurous appeals for a lot of people. Then you just decided to go into teaching. I guess you were just kind of looking for a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I'd had enough. I, I I spent many many years in it, you know, and I started out, I started out as a musician in the music business, as a, as, a, as you're playing in rock bands and stuff like that, and eventually went on to um, go into management and production and things like that. And the music business, I loved every minute. I have no regrets. Don't get me wrong; it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But it, I, I don't consider it a job or even a career. It's a lifestyle. Right. My life was not my own. My my days were 16, 18 hours, you know, going on and on for for endless times. I needed kind of a life. I needed kind of had done with this. So I moved on, and and I had I had gotten my college degree. <clears> so I decided, you know, it'd be nice to go into teaching. At least that's a, that's a creative thing too. Mm-hmm. But um, I'd had enough of the music industry after being in it for 20 years. You know, and it's it's such an illusion for people who haven't actually been in it to realize what it is. I remember Stevie Nicks one time was talking about how when you're in that kind of business is that you have this false sense of, I'm trying to remember the right word that she used, acceptance I believe it is, that people just really want you. Well, the truth is they just want the opportunity to, you know, have what it is that you have. Tell us about that experience, if you could. Oh yeah, it was, and that was kind of the final straw for me, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know you're very important, you're very you know, popular, you're very all you know, all your friends and all your things and everything around you is is doing you know really good and they all like you. And kind of the last straw was I was I was um, between jobs, shall we say, I was looking for a job and looking for things, and I had people in the industry <clears throat> that were business acquaintances, as we have. But I had who I people I thought were my friends. Mm-hmm. And I thought my close friends. Well, you know, and, and there's always the people that are, you know, what can you do for me? What can you get for me? What can you, how can you know? Because I was pretty up in the business, and I knew a lot of people and record company execs and things like that. Well, after about a year, I'm sat there with myself going like, you know, I have no friends. My my so-called friends wouldn't even return my calls. It was kind of a rude awakening that all these people really wanted was to be in with someone that can get them and their career somewhere into being with the no people. So mm-hmm. it was kind of a, a rude awakening. Um, again, it's the, it's the kind of business where it's, you're so busy and you're so active and it almost lends itself to that because you don't have time to deal with anything but what's most important for you, your career, and everything else. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's, it's one of those mm-hmm. catch-22 things. Like I said, I loved every minute. I had a great time. I had a great run. But it came a time when I go like, you know, I want friends that like me because of who I am, not because of what I can do for them. <laughs> you know, and when you get into your, I was in my, my, my mid-30s when I left, and I thought, enough of this. You know, I want people that, I want a real life. I want to work a regular job and not have my whole life surrounded by this and, and going crazy all the time and and all that stuff. So it's, it's you know, thing for, and for all those people who make it, I mean, they have to really be dedicated, committed, and... um Give give everything they have, and of course they do. I mean, I loved every minute that I had. I was in it too, either as a player mm-hmm. or as a in in the, in the business side of it. But it 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 is all consuming. If you don't mm-hmm. have that drive 
to, to kind of take over your life, you really need to do something else. It's mm-hmm. not like you can go and do a nine to five job or anything. I remember, Stephen, uh, years ago, I had the opportunity to run into uh, someone who actually worked Studio 54. Gee, sure. there's a pinnacle of the 1970s oh, if there ever was one. And the, and the funny thing was, is uh, it was just around that time that it would be about five years before this this meeting that I had actually spent some time as someone who worked as a bartender in nightclubs, and uh, and it was really interesting because that gives you a real glimpse and a slight idea of what it is that, for instance, people like yourself who were maybe in a rock band, you were a rock star, a glimpse and a feeling and an idea of what that lifestyle is like. You know, you're partying all the time, you know, and this, uh, and this gentleman from Studio 54 said, you know, it was a lot of fun, but he says, I was so damn glad to get out of it because it would have killed me. And he says, it's just a hard hard life and you, and as we were talking about uh just earlier here about the illusion of people you know wanting this false sense of acceptance that when you step out you almost understood that it was all an illusion that these people weren't real because i knew as soon as i stepped out of doing that these people that you believed were friends that you were doing a lot of things with you know just never called or even bothered to see how you were doing and it was a good thing that I kind of set myself up to think, this is all an illusion. I know once I step away, I may never see most of these people ever again. And I was so right, so it didn't shatter my ego as badly as I had seen it do with other people that I knew who did the very same thing. Right, no, exactly. And and when you're in it, you don't really, well, sometimes you don't even realize it. But I know even, even um, friends I knew, and luckily one of the people I worked with was a record producer by the name of Ken Scott. He he had worked with EMI and the Beatles and Rolling Stones and mm-hmm. Elton John and everybody. And I worked with him for many many years. And I remember, and I had people that I that were my friends. And three times that he came to me and and warned me. Luckily, he was a very honorable and very respectable man. He came to me and said, "I'm not sure you should. This person's your best friend." And I said, "Why do you say that?" He said, "Well, this person has come to me and said that they would do your job for half of what I pay you." This was my best friend <laughs> coming to my boss or my, my partner saying that get rid of me, hire him for half price. Right. And that was the only reason they were my friend is to get in, you know, in close with this guy. Uh-huh. That's the kind of business it was. It's so cutthroat and so nasty and so mean-spirited. Uh-huh. You, can't, you almost can't trust anybody. At the same time, there's some really very respectful and very responsible and very good people in it. So it's really hard to sort through those when you're in it and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Now, Stephen, what made you, I guess, go into uh, the business in the first place? I mean, was this a childhood dream? One day you seen Elvis and said, "That's what I want to do." Or I actually was where uh, I was raised um, on classical music. I was a classical musician, okay, and I loved music. Music was always wonderful to me. And I got into my first rock band when I was in um, high school, actually. Mm-hmm. And then all through college, you know, I was going all through college. I was playing in rock bands. And I just loved playing. I mean, it was something I just really enjoyed and really loved doing. So I had to make the transition from classical, which is reading music, to performing and playing rock music. And I played some jazz and blues and other things as well. And I just loved it. And so I got involved with some other bands. And um, it was just, it was, it was fun. I mean, it was much more fun than, you know, sitting behind a desk or doing a day job or doing a desk job or doing anything like that. I really had a great time doing it. It was a very creative endeavor. You know, it was very family. It was very, you know, when you're in a band, it's sort of like that's, that's your family, that's your group, that's your people you hang out with. And I, and I loved it just so much. So I, I decided to pursue it professionally, which I did. I mean, I, I did go, you know, did go through and did complete my college degree during all this time. Mm-hmm. And at, towards the end of it, I just went ahead and started playing professionally. I was playing six nights a week doing nightclubs. Mm-hmm. And loved every minute of it. I had a great time. And then, and then I was, and, and then bands change personnel, and things change, and things happen. And between that, during at during at one of those times, I still planned on continuing playing. Um, I was offered a job working for a, ma- a manager, a Cat Stevens manager, actually. I thought, well, I can do this, and I can still play at nights and do my thing, and blah blah blah. Well, once you kind of get away from it, you and you get into the business side, and it was with some pretty heavy people. You know, you get into that side of it, and so and that led to the, the 
job with the record producer and things like that. So it, it led to other things. I still loved it. It was still creative. It was still all that. And I even to this day, I still love playing music. I still play in bands and orchestras and things like that around town. I don't play much rock and roll anymore, much to my dismay. But it's just something that you love to do. It's like it's like having your hobby and making a living at it. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm sure it's the same thing for people in sports like Tiger Woods or something. This is something they love to do, and they might as well you know work at work hard and make a living at it. Right. I know Peter Frampton actually made that reference many years ago as well. He says. Here I was playing music, and then all of a sudden I was being paid for it. And he says that was just like icing on the cake. And that really has to be the attitude, I would think, that would set the inner foundation for a lot of the crap, I guess, you have to put up with to get to that level, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have to love it. You have, And even the stars today, the people that are big popular today, they have to love what they're doing. If mm-hmm. they don't love it, I know many people that stayed in it, and a lot of people got out of it just for that reason, because you have to love it. You have to love every minute of it, because it is mm-hmm. all-consuming. It is very hard. But at the beginning, it's like, oh, my God, why am I why am I going to get an office job when I can go out and play nights in nightclubs or play in this and actually get paid for it and make a living at it right. and be a professional musician? You know, this was this was great, fun, and, you know, exciting times. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, why not do this and give this a shot? So, I mean, I, I gave it a shot. I did very well at it for the time. But there came a time when it was time to leave and time to move on and let, you know, the powers it be. Mm-hmm. I know that's why when you take a look, especially as you uh, talk uh, in your book, uh, Hollywood, about what these four people uh, go through, is that, you know, there's so much to this that people don't see. You know, for instance... <clears throat> At the end result, you have the fans who see the performance. You have the people, you know, as they get the awards, they, they view all the things. The end result is really what it comes down to. But it's everything before that point that they don't see that, you know, at times people wonder, you know, how come they're making so much money and they're getting all this? You know, they don't work all that hard. And it's like, well, you know, these people spend, you're, you're looking at 18 hours a day or better, you know every day of the week to get to this level. And that's, you know, to get to where they want to be, not to mention everybody getting in the way to kind of take that away all at the same time. And, you know, when you start to realize what this is, like it it becomes extraordinary uh, when you see, for instance, groups like the Rolling Stones still doing what they do today. Oh, I know. It's It's just, it's awesome. It's, it's just like, for instance, one of my, one of my favorite sports is, is basketball. When you realize what it takes just to play at the NBA level, to sit on the bench and hope the coach will call you in, you know, to to being on the starting five, to being the superstar, <laughs> you know, what it takes to get to those levels, it almost seems awesome. Yeah, they're still practicing all those hours a day and all the time a day and all that time mm-hmm. of stuff. And, yeah, like I said, my days, my hours, I mean, I would spend 18, 20 hours a day sometimes. I mean, and it was, <clears> especially <throat> when I was in the business, you know, when I was in the band, we rehearsed and practiced all day, learned new songs all day, played mm-hmm. the night comes at night, got off at 2 o'clock in the morning, got up the next day, and was back to back to the routine. In the business, I was getting up at, you know, 5, 6 in the morning, making my London calls and my New York calls, going to work all day, you know, doing, using, you know, power, you know, networking, lunches and dinners and things like that, going to a rock concert at night, and then after the rock concert, there was always an after party that you'd go to, and it sounds wonderful and exciting, but it was work because it was networking. Mm-hmm. It was meeting the record companies and the executives and the managers and producers and the agents and all that stuff. You know, get get home at 2 o'clock and get up at 6 again and start over again. Mm-hmm. And that was a typical day. Like I said, it was wonderful. It was exciting. I loved every minute. I have no regrets. But there comes a point when you go, like, enough's enough. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, even for those one-hit wonders, I mean, those people that, that they think, well, they just, they just kind of did this. They have worked really hard to get where they are. <laughs> they have spent, and, and touring is just brutal for these people. I mean, right. you think about touring when they come into a town, it is just brutal. They don't realize how much hard work it is for them to get it. And I don't think they also realize how many people that have struggled and worked really, really hard and never do make it. For, the, for, mm-hmm. the, for every act that make it, there's thousands, maybe tens of thousands of acts that never really break. Mm-hmm. Now, what is it, uh, I guess, when it comes to that, the formula, is there a rhyme or reason? Because like you said, I've heard some musicians and bands, and you think, my goodness, how come these guys never broke through? This stuff is outstanding. I mean, what's going on there? Uh, it's, it's, it's a, 
there's, a, there's so many factors involved. And I mean, I've, I've, even I've worked on quite a new albums that are in the, you know, the archives of Capitol Records or Columbia Records or, or Arista Records or whatever that never really did much of anything no one ever heard of. It has to do with a lot of different things, I think. And, and um, you know, number one, you have to have, you know, I have sort of my formula is you have to have a certain level of musicianship, obviously. But I think beyond that, it comes down to material. And, and not only just, just the material that you're playing or they're playing, but how it's executed, how it's arranged, how it's worked out. I mean, one person can put out a song, and the next person can take it, rearrange it, redo it, and it becomes a big hit just because it's been redone. Um, so many musicians, and one of the reasons I wrote the book was because so many of the th- groups I would go and see when I was out scouting bands and looking at bands and looking at groups and stuff, was they, had, they made the same mistakes and made the same issues the, internally with, as far as musicianship. You might have five or six great musicians on stage or four, but you know, there's no song there. They're all overplaying. They're all showing off. Yeah, the drummer's great. The guitar player's great. But there's no sound. Writing mm-hmm. a song and getting a song on the radio is a whole different ball game. Right, and you have to make sure that it's 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 accessible to your audience within the within the parameters of not selling out, within the parameters of doing what you really do. But just because you're a great guitar player, you don't have to play that great guitar lead every all the time, every time when the lead singer is trying to sing or someone else is trying to mm-hmm. sing. You show off when it's your turn to show off, and you back off when it's your turn to back off. So many bands just overplay. And then mm-hmm. even when well, with all that in place, I mean, you have image and you have all kind of things. And some groups I've seen, I've seen some groups that aren't all that great, but they had a great image. <laughs> you know, look at Psy with, the, with that thing he has from, um, you know, the Gangnam Style. Right. That's all image. I mean, it's not a bad little... T- you ditty, mean like you know Motley I mean? Crue? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's all him. I mean, Kiss, but Kiss has some great stuff. And even Motley Crue, I used to see, I see Motley Crue play nightclubs all the time. Right. And they had their image and their thing down and their heavy, rock, heavy metal thing down. And they did it really well. And that's why they got to be, you know, who they were and what they did. Because what they did, they did it really well. And it eventually got their audience. So, mm-hmm. And then in the, in the end, there's, a, there's a, a certain amount of luck involved. Right. Of hitting the right place at the right time with the right people and getting your right audience and doing the right thing. I mean, you think of Image. I mean, think of, you know, of, of um, you know, could Kiss have been a boy band? Probably not. Right. Could Motley Crue have been, you know, um, boys to men? Probably not. Mm-hmm. But they had their image and they had their, 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 their act together with what they were doing. You know, and when we talk about uh, bands like, for instance, those two, for instance, Motley Crue and Kiss, and even though Kiss still performs today, is that you also look at an element of timelessness. For instance, Tom Petty and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Mm -hmm. Timeless. I mean, you listen to the music he was producing in the 1970s, is still just as relevant and loved today as it was then. You look at a band like Rush out of Canada, you know, still, they're just timeless. They can keep producing and still be relevant even today. And that's even a whole different level of musicianship that w- and, and a lot of what you're talking about, I would think. No, absolutely. And they can also take their audience to places where they can. They have their distinct sound. I mean, you know, when you hear a Rush song, you know it's a Rush song. When right. You, hear, you know, you know it's, it's, it's still who it is. But they can still stay current and still stay whatever. The, the groups that don't stay current are the groups that generally, oh, we've seen this before, we've heard this before, enough's enough, let's just be done with this. Mm-hmm. But you even think back to the Beatles. I mean, the Beatles, you know, one thinks how great they were. Their first single was, I want to hold your hand. Not exactly groundbreaking material, <laughs> you know? But they, they captured an audience, they captured a thing with other singles and other things and, and continued on and took their audience with them and, and were able to, to, to stay ahead of the, the thing and became the trendsetters themselves as opposed to, you know, laying into, we're just going to do this and we're just going to do that. Mm-hmm. And if a group can do that, they can, they can stay current and stay with it. A lot of groups leave because they just get tired and they're, they're touring now. I see them all the time now. These, I call them my geezers of rock that I go on. I used to see them back in the 70s and 80s and 60s sometimes, and now they're touring again mm-hmm. because they miss it and they want to do it as well. And they're still mm-hmm. good. But you even see a group like Kiss, if you've ever seen them live, they put on quite a show. Right. Right. You know, I mean, it's like them or not like them, they put on quite a show. <laughs> now, what is it like for you when your students discover that you used to be in a rock and roll band? Do you get to tell a lot of stories? 
I told some stories. I mean, I kind of kept that secret because then it gets, it gets into all kinds of other questions and stuff sure. like that. And as kids, and, and you know, I, I taught mostly younger kids. I taught English and drama mostly, um, and for middle school ages. And it was kind of, I just kind of kept that that life separately. And the only time I did use that was, uh, you know, on my school my school was fourth grade to twelfth grade, so I helped on the high school shows too. So when it came to producing the shows, oftentimes I would help with the tech. I would do the help them with the sound or the lights, or to teach the kids how to do sound and lights and things like that. And sometimes I'd have to pull that. Well, you know, I was a record producer one day, or you know, I was a lighting person, or blah blah blah, because they would they would kind of you know kids can be a little whatever. I'd, I'd have to pull that, and they they would they would it gave me a little more credibility, I would think. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, it didn't really come up too much. You know, it was. I kind of left that that life, my my music life, behind me, because oh. um, it, 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 it wasn't really pertinent to what I was doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. You know, and, and it was fun to read uh, Hollywood, and there were some times that I just kept having the image of the movie Almost Famous pop into my mind. It is a little similar in ways. Yeah, I agree. It, it, yeah, it is, and it isn't just because it's like the movie. It just reminded me of that movie because that movie really kind of shows well this is kind of really what life is is you're starting to form a band you're actually getting out there to perform and you're kind of getting your legs to get to that place that i think a lot of people who create bands want to get to which is that point where you're making great money you've got a huge fan base and you're touring and there's that moment where it's a lot of fun but it doesn't last forever in fact it almost seems Fleeting to the point, as you said earlier, it becomes like a business. And boy, do you really have to buck up if you want to continue when it gets to that point, I would think. Oh, it does become a business. It mm-hmm. becomes, you know, hello, insert city here. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to rock? I mean, it becomes so staged. and so, But it has to, it can never seem staged. It mm-hmm. has to seem natural. It has to seem, I mean, all that stuff comes up in the book. And of course, you know, the personnel changes, and you know, and, and I wanted to kind of represent it, you know, with 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 the characters in the book, you know, everyone's all all musicians. I think there has to be a certain amount of of ego involved for them just to get up and do that. They have to think that yeah, they're better than that. Yeah, they're better than this. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. But in reality, they have to learn it all, and mm-hmm. they have to kind of be knocked down a little step. And and sometimes their ego gets in the way because they become too arrogant. And they're not really willing to listen or to learn. And and this band, and that's why I wrote it as a fiction book, because this band makes all the mistakes, you know, whether it be um, in their playing, in their abilities, in their image, in their contractual issues with 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 production companies, and they had to learn who all the players are and who all the situations are, and how to really put on a show and how to make it how to make it work. And I wanted to do that, and that's kind of why I originally wrote the book was as kind of a how to. For these groups, like I said, I saw so many would make the, so many of the same mistakes over and over and over again, whether it be overplaying or, you know, yeah, it's a great song, but, you know, where's the song? You know, you, you, you just covered it up because your guitar lead was overplaying this part or doing whatever, or you've, you know, just messed it up. You, know, you, look like rock, you, you look like you're playing like rock stars on stage. It's not real. There's no reality to it. Mm-hmm. There's no anything, you know, some substance there. And... Um, and all the, 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 you know, the, I call them distractions and temptations that happen in the business, which are pretty rampant, you know, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, Stephen, and uh, speaking uh, about temptations, and, and as a guy, this is something I always wondered. I'm sure a lot of guys are like that, too. But you have a character in the book, Gloria. Now, here she becomes, uh, you know, the front girl of the band. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting when you write about basically how she feeds her temptations of screwing around with other guys. And you kind of always wondered that, you know, here's this hot female singer, you know, as she, for lack of a better way to put this, slutty just like guys would be. <laughs> she is. She is. She is. And <laughs> but I the to funny make... thing is, is the way that you describe, well, hey, why can't she be? You know, but go ahead and talk about how you came to, to premise that character that way. Well, I debated with her on that, because, but mm-hmm. I wanted her to really be a liberated woman. Right. You know, because I, I, each, each of the characters kind of represent, as I, I'm sure you found out, I, I wanted to open up the book to not just be a bunch of rock people that play rock songs. Right. So I tried to create characters that kind of represented the area, the, the era, and the, it goes back to the 60s and their backstories. 
So it's mm-hmm. kind of the 60s and the 70s. So you have that political activist that's involved with, that was a hippie and that was, you know, involved with all the drugs and the political activist stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the ex-junkie, you have the black activist from Detroit. Uh, I wanted her to really be a liberated woman. And I knew women like that, that were really just tough women. Mm-hmm. That, that, you know, burn your bra, I'm going to be a tough woman, I'm allowed to enjoy sex. Kind of like Joan Jett. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And all are black. I mean, those women were, were tough. They were tough women. Right. And why shouldn't a woman have you know those those advantages as well? I mean, I mm-hmm. could have made her dainty and sweet and all that kind of stuff, but that just didn't seem to fit, and it didn't seem to fit with the band and with the with the whole way the story went. So and I, the audience would have wouldn't have bought it either. So. <laughs> no, I mean she has to be a tough. I mean, I I love the the open when when she first meets the band and then and she's just like blowing them off and she's right. just bantering back with them and just she's like yeah you, you know calling them all kind of names and doing all kind of things. I mean, she mm-hmm. has to be a tough cookie herself. And, of course, her background lends itself to that, you know, with, mm-hmm. with, with being a Navy brat and the things that happened to her in her past right. mm-hmm. um, and being the ex-biker chick. I mean, she was a, she was a tough... She was a tough broad, and she's <laughs> going to go out there and she's going to have a good time, and she's going to take advantage of those guys and, and, you know, whether they like it or not. And so I thought that might be was an interesting kind of... She's just like one of the guys, right. to, be, to be honest with you. She's just, I mean, in fact, she's sometimes more, I mean, she's, some of the other characters don't go off and aren't, aren't as slutty as she is. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it it almost kind of reminded me, too, Stephen, as, uh, as she was coming into the game. As I, I, for some reason, I started thinking of Freddie Mercury, you know. I'm going to have a great time as much as I can for as long as I can. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. Yeah, why not? That's <laughs> what, and, 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 you know. Enjoy it for what it is, and have a good time, and and that's what it should be all about, you know, in the in the in the long run. But and she doesn't back down to the guys. I didn't want a a, a mousy little, you know, okay, I'll do this. Mm-hmm. I mean, she puts she gives it back, and she she's she's tough with them, and she gives it right back to them, mm-hmm. which I think is a is a good thing. I mean, I think it's a it's 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 a it's, it's good for her character to do mm-hmm. that. And then one of the other characters as well uh, is gay. And Correct. So. And there's a lot of that element, actually. And it's funny because I remember back when I was in high school, one of the bands, uh, if you happen to love heavy metal, was Judas Priest. Mm -hmm. And I asserted, I said, I believe Rob Halford is gay. And boy, I got pummeled for that, you know. Oh, bullshit, you know, this guy is a heavy metal band. And and I'm like, are you kidding me? Look at him. If anybody had ever seen, you know, the, the cruising type movie or whatever the case is, Mm-hmm. The guy undeniably is showing that I am. And then years later, I was actually talking with an old high school buddy. And he says, I remember when you brought that up, but I couldn't believe when I found out that he actually was. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> you know? yeah. But, you know, the fact is is that you don't make those associations. It's almost the same thing as saying, how could you be gay and be a heavyweight boxer? So I like the way that you really have that colorful mix, but that's a lot of what the 60s and 70s was. And that's what I wanted to have. And that's why I wanted to have the gay character, the the struggles of coming out and the struggles of dealing with his friends and his family and his Mm -hmm. things like that and and, and, and him having his his own issues with with coming out gay. And and even even some of the dialogue. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, sometimes I thought maybe it's just a little too much little too much character study but i thought it could where you know the, like the when he comes out to his the, the one guy he's like oh my god but but you're like a regular guy how can you be gay right it's kind of a statement mm-hmm. and but that's what i wanted to have is 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 a kind of an indication and kind of a variety of people that kind of reflected just and i don't think i go into too much detail but just kind of reflected the times and i think all of those issues are still very, I mean, extremely relevant today. Mm-hmm. Even with with the with the gay issue, of course, with gay marriage going on with the Supreme Court, you have with the drug issues, even with the with the legalizing of marijuana up in certain er- in certain places. Um, but still, women's issues are being talked about. Black issues are being are going on, and all that. And of course, sex is always going on. But you know, I wanted I wanted to have it a little more meat than just be we're a bunch of you know you know rock and roll rock and rollers and we're just going to have to have rock and roll fun time and i thought that made it a little too you know one-dimensional well i liked it because it really compels people who may not have lived in the 70s to realize this was what was really going on and of course i grew up in the 70s i was a teenager in the 70s and you know really it was a time that i loved i loved the music i loved what was going on i was growing up actually in in the wilmington 
San Pedro area, just right sure. up the street in Long Beach, California, is oh, where well. streaking was very, very yeah prevalent. I'm sure you do. I remember the Hollywood sign. It's funny. I would tell people, I said, I have never seen the Hollywood sign whole, and they don't understand what I'm talking about. It's like when I lived you know, outside and we would travel by Hollywood, you would see maybe a letter missing or pieces of a letter missing. You never seen the whole Hollywood sign like you do today. <laughs> and so people can't fathom that. And it's just funny because it's just it's kind of one of them lost eras. Like, did this really happen? Almost like a dream that you woke up and went, okay, I guess maybe that wasn't as real as I thought it was. And then you look at the state of things today. And you sometimes kind of wonder, this day and age, do they just take things too seriously? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a fun, exciting time. And, mm-hmm. and there's, a, there's an old saying that if you remember the 60s, you probably weren't there. They said that about the 70s as and well. The 70s is too, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, but it was, it was a fun, exciting time. A lot of things were happening politically, mm-hmm. you know, socially, you know, in all, in all different, I mean, the whole world changed, I think. Mm-hmm. In in the in the sixties and seventies, I mean, when you come out of the fifties, which was so conservative and so restricted, and you know everyone was getting their their MBAs and being very serious and being very this, this was a time of you know I mean you had, you know the the um, Lovins in the park and and all mm-hmm. that stuff going on in San Francisco, and they had them in L.A. too, at Griffith Park they would have them because I grew up in L.A. obviously, mm-hmm. and um, it was just a more a, a more interesting time. It was kind of rejection of some of those you know super conservative times but it was it was because we wanted to have we wanted to enjoy life we wanted to enjoy the things that life offered to us mm-hmm. and uh, so many of the things that that are that were around then and so maybe it, it was it was a fun fun time yeah and so yeah and and, that, and the book a lot of that book is based on you know my my reality actually it's mm-hmm. kind of what i wrote it it was it was kind of like oh my god well, you know, you kind of get that sense about this, too, because of the dialogue. It's very rich in this story. You know, a lot of times uh, you tend to read books perhaps maybe like this, and there's a lot of description about what's going on or character development about who these people are, but you tend to develop a lot of the context of the scenery through the dialogue, which a person reading this might say, you know, somebody must have read this and remembered a hell of a lot of conversations. Well, it was that, it was that, and it was intentional because I didn't want to. I just didn't want, you know. One as an English teacher, I used to tell my kids, um, "Don't, you know, you need to show it, don't tell it." Right. It needs to become immediate, and it made the book longer because when I originally wrote it, there was a lot more of just telling the story. I said, this has to be an incident. This has to be a situation. This has to be something going on, a dialogue or talking about this. I can't just say what happened to this person in the past. They need to talk about it and how they felt about it. And, I, and, and by doing that, it, it enlarged the book greatly, but I thought it made it more, more real and more interesting. Um, than just you know saying well in the past they were this in the past they were that I'm, you know I'm bored already you know what I mean. So <laughs> well, I, I, certainly I you make... added that dimension, Stephen, with the character again of Gloria because rather than saying this is how she was, she actually says this, and you feel a sense of shock by it. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to make it. This is this is real people saying their their real issues in real situations, and I wanted the dialogue to be to take over from just telling the story to be more of the storyteller and to make it palatable and make it fun and interesting and exciting mm-hmm. and, and whatever it is. I did the same thing even with some of the little historic stuff with Hollywood. I didn't just want to say, well, they're driving down the street. I wanted to add all the little... Because everybody you know, has this fantasy of what Hollywood's like, so I had some little history things in there. Not mm-hmm. a lot, but you found you know, a little talk about the nightclubs. I had, to, I had to intersperse reality and fiction, of course, you know, for, for, for obvious reasons. But, you know, when they're going to the whiskey or they're going to the Roxy or they're going to the Forum or they're going to the, the nightclubs and stuff or, to, or driving around Hollywood or L.A., you know, I wanted to, to make it seem like they were really driving around or standing in their backyard looking at the Hollywood sign. You know, make it, make it more of a, an interesting and, and make it more real. Mm-hmm. Now, you start off each of your chapters uh, with the title of a song. Correct. And I thought that was very unique uh, for me personally. Uh, and going back uh, several years, I was taking a, a course or two here in broadcasting uh, just because it was something I wanted to do 
But I had always wanted to be a disc jockey growing up, of course, in L.A. with people like Machine Gun Kelly and Wolfman Jack. And I remember them These well. guys seemed to always be in the center, as I would tell people when they would ask, well, what do you want to do that for? Well, just because it looks like it would be a lot of fun, you know, because you, you pictured these guys were at the beach at the party or they were at the drag races or they were right there, you know, at opening night of the Rolling Stones concert. These people were there, and that was something... I wanted to do. I would have never thought him years later that I would be an interview style talk show host, which I really love because anyway. But the thing is, is while I was in this class uh, back in, in college, and I was 30 years old at the time, as there were a lot of these young and up and coming uh, wannabe disc jockeys that were enjoying the pop 40 bubblegum radio stations and wanting to be these wild, outlandish, far out disc jockeys. Uh, that the teacher was trying to get across a point about what the role of the disc jockey or the broadcaster is, is to create imagination. And they, he just couldn't seem to bridge the gap there to get these younger kids to understand the 18 to early 20-somethings. And, and I said, you know, here's what he's really trying to say. If you're out there spinning records at a radio station, your job is to weave a story or at least to create something around that because for many people it's the first time they'll hear the song and there'll be a moment that they're experiencing when that song comes on and that was clearly when i think back to the 70s and i hit each of these chapters where you have the title of a song there it did exactly that i could remember definitively what i was doing and how i would feel at that particular moment that song came on whereas today <clears throat> most kids would relate it to something they've seen on YouTube or a video which takes away that element of imagination. And the teacher was like, you're spot on. That's exactly what I've been trying to describe here, you know, to these kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of imagination that to me almost seems lost in a way. And I'm kind of wondering, what do you think about the state of the music industry? Is it different today than it was then? I think... You know, and I, I'm, I've been away from it a long time, obviously. Right. Um, I think a lot of things are the same, and I think a lot of things have changed. I think that, um, um, I think music labels, record companies, you know, in the old days they would take a chance on something they believed in, you know. Nowadays, they're not as willing to take chances because there is, you know, where's your fan base? You must have a thing on YouTube. How many, how many hits have you had on your YouTube video? Mm -hmm. they, want to, they want to have a more of a sure thing. I think it's become more corporate. I don't think there's as much. I mean, in the, in the old days, we had, I mean, look at the variety of material. Look at the variety of music we had back in that. I mean, it was, there was country. There was, I mean, some of the, there was country. There was uh, folk. There was a little bit of heavy metal. There was a little bit of everything. It all kind of came together in the 60s and 70s. Now I think it's more fragmented. But now the record companies, just, they just want the big hit. They want the million seller. They, mm -hmm. don't want to, they don't want to develop acts that might not be the million, you know, the, the quadruple platinum albums. They want to just have the quadruple platinum and, and not do the other stuff as well and just have a, a respectable mm -hmm. group that, that comes and performs. So mm -hmm. I think, I think in, but at the same time, with YouTube and those, these bands have a, at least exposure for themselves they might not have otherwise had. Right. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. In some ways, it's a good thing. In some ways, it's not so good a thing. Mm -hmm. It's funny, actually. I went... And um, the local newspaper here, we have a big, big thing called Coachella Fest, Coachella Music Festival, which is a music festival that happens every year. It's mostly rock bands and all, mostly all, mostly alternative bands that play here. And so uh, they have the book and they were reading it and stuff. And so they, when they got the lineup for the Coachella Fest, they wanted me to comment on it. And of course, you know, 80, 80 90 percent of them are the groups I'd never heard of. So I wanted to do my <laughs> homework. You know, some I mean, some of Red Hot Chili Peppers, of course, is playing. And there's a couple of old groups in the 80s. Lou Reed was going to play and. Mm. Orchestra Maneuvers in the Dark and a few others that I remembered. But I wanted to go hear what these groups were. And I, I went, went and went on YouTube. I was able to listen to all these groups you know, that were going to play Coachella Fest and make comments on them. It was kind of, and what was kind of interesting is I could just go like, oh, this is a 60s group. Oh, this is a 70s group. Oh, this is an 80s group. Oh, this is, this is a Pink Floyd thing. Or this is a Rolling Stones thing. Or, you know what I mean? Right. It's, it's like it, it's, but you know, these kids don't know what those a lot of what a lot of those people were doing. A lot of those, and, mo, and more so the the lesser known groups that you don't hear on classic rock. 
you hear you hear those. So it was kind of interesting to go and listen to go like, oh yeah, you know everything's everything that's old is new again. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. that was kind of what I what I wanted to do with the chapters because mm-hmm. the chapters were like, I wanted to foreshadow, but I wanted to kind of remind you, but at the same time foreshadow what happened in that chapter. So it was mm-hmm. kind of calculated what I had to do with picking those out was a little difficult sometimes. So I wanted to reflect what the chapter was about. I know it's fascinating to see, too, when you look at the generation of today that reaches back to those days and go, wow, you old geezers had a lot of great music. <laughs> they did. There was some great stuff out there. And I'm, I'm curious to see if this generation is going to have the classics. And there's some really great music out today, I sure think. Sure there is. Mm-hmm. Um, that I'm, I wonder if they're going to become the classics that we had back with the Rolling Stones and mm-hmm. with the Beatles and with the... Uh, you know all the other groups that were playing Elton John and all those people, mm-hmm. because there was there was you know that that stuff is classic stuff. It'll there, there's some great songs there. And you know, I wonder if the groups nowadays are going to have that same longevity and have that same kind of attitude. I think uh, you hit on one key person there that I think is really phenomenal to bring up, and that's Elton John. I remember back in I believe it was 1978 when he decided to announce that he was retiring from the business and i'm like sure elton what else are you gonna do i mean you're at the top of your game for crying out loud but i remember going to see him uh and this was back in 1998 okay that sounds about right it was in january of 1998 i decided uh in portland oregon to go and see him for the first time since the 1970s actually and what was phenomenal about going to this concert was the generational range that you've seen here. Right. And exactly. I thought that was such a cool testament, not to just the guy's career, but that families could bring their younger children to a concert like this. And you knew this guy was just going to push it out, even for his age. And, you know, and, and I think that's just really exciting to see that you see these bands or these singers from the ages of old who have that kind of ability to appeal to multiple generations as they put on these concerts. No, yeah. Well, and Elton does, he, he bridges all those gaps with all those things. You go into concerts, because I've seen him many, many times over there. Right. He was one of my favorite performers and, and songwriters and everything. I've seen him, you know, back I mean, in the 70s and all the way through. And he's, he always puts on a great a great show and a great thing, but he does bridge that cap. And it was interesting when I was a teacher talking to the high school kids, the amount of high school kids. Of course, their parents were all into the classic rock. Sure. But even a lot of the high school kids would talk about, oh, yeah, you know, I love, you know, I mean, it was amazing to hear him talk about Pink Floyd. Well, obviously, you know, if they're doing Pink Floyd, you know what else they're doing. <laughs> yeah. They're smoking that funny cigarettes, too. You can tell, oh, you must, okay, I know where you're at now, and you're like, you know. But it was just, you know, kind of a rite of passage almost. And but all the other groups and and some of them have that longevity, but some of them are very time specific. I remember going to a big concert in L.A. Um, this was years ago. This was probably late '90s, early 2000s, maybe. And it was an '80s concert. I mean, Flock of Seagulls, I think, was there, and a few others. Well, you know, I was the old one there. Everybody there, obviously, they were in their late teens, early 20s when these groups came out. And Dressed in neon in colors, it. of course. Pardon? <laughs> Dressed in neon colors. <laughs> right. And I was going like, oh my God, I feel really old. Cause like, when you go to Elton John or you go to Rolling Stone, there is. I mean, there's a there's a, a lot of us old timers there, but there's a lot of the young kids there too. Right. But there's some groups like this 80s concert was like, I'm the only old one here. These people, you know, they were all like 20 years younger than me because I was I was in the business in the 80s, so I knew these groups really well. But, you know, I wasn't in high school either. These, right. these obviously were the p- people that liked these groups when they were in high school. So it was, it was very um, age-specific on that concert. So some of the groups can transcend it and, and cash in on that, and some of the groups have a difficult time doing that. I, you mm. know, and, and I never know what that formula is. I think a lot of it has to do, I hate, you know, I don't hate to say it, a lot of it does have to do with radio. What, what the, what's on the playlist of the classic yeah. radio stations? I mean, they, they do, you know, when I go to the classic radio, it's, it is... It's almost that that controlled playlist again, you know, where you have we can play Elton John, we can play Rolling Stones, and we can play the Beatles, and we can play, you know, a few other odds and ends. But you know, there, there was some obscure bands even back then that were wonderful that you hardly ever hear. Mm-hmm. There is still one group that I have been digging around trying to find any live performances that I never did get a chance to see, 
And that is one of my favorite bands of all time, Three Dog Night. Oh well, they broke up. In fact, they they mm-hmm. they yeah they did. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. I saw them back in the seventies, and they were actually quite good. But they kind of broke up. They had a lot of personnel changes. In fact, I mean, just out of as a funny aside, my parents lived up near Yosemite, and the original drummer from Three Dog Night retired from that, and he opened a little diner store up there. Mm-hmm. And um, that's just one of the groups. Yeah, that's one of the groups you really don't hear much on the radio. And they had some major hits. And a lot of them, too. I mean, it was not unusual to hear. Like, you get a Best Of album, and most of those were at least in the top ten at one point or another, and sometimes together. And Mm -hmm. and again, that's one of those things that I think that, you know, radio just hasn't crashed in on the Three Dog Night thing. You know, mind you, it could have been their their publicist or whatever that wasn't pushing it, or it could have been any number of factors. But, you know, that's one group that, that didn't really cash in on the classic rock thing, you know, for whatever reason. And mm-hmm. there are a number of, of groups like that. But you know, they were huge in their day. And uh, you very seldom hear a Three Dog Night song on the radio, if, if, if at all. I and if you do, it's usually the same one, <laughs> Joy right, to the World. One, or it's, you know, <laughs> Jeremiah was a bullfrog. <laughs> exactly. Fascinating book, Hollywood, The Band, A Tale of Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll. Our guest today is Stephen Brooks. Now, is there a website people can find out more about this? I don't have a website. They, okay. can, they can get, I, I mean, I'm on Facebook. If mm-hmm. they go onto Facebook and put Stephen Jordan Brooks in there, they can. there's some little things on there. Of course, the book is available through um, any major um, online retailer, um, you know, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. They can go to Book Finder for you or Books a Million, and it'll list all the, wherever the cheapest prices are. I mean, it's mm-hmm. also available to my publisher, but generally my publisher charges more than Amazon or the other places, so they can go there and, and get those. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's available through a lot of different places. And yeah, it's a great thing if you're if it's you know the, one of the other reasons I wrote the book was to explain how the industry works. So for mm-hmm. anybody that's wanting to find out what a band has to do to make it and how the industry works, it explains as you found out what a publicist does, what a mm-hmm. producer does, what an engineer does, what a, the roadies do, what the the um, manager does. It explains all those parts. And I think it is very kind of fun and even the attorneys are in there. Mm-hmm. It's kind of kind of a fun way. So um it's 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 good for that. And it's also very timely, the time piece. And it's it's also has pretty some pretty wild things that go on it. Oh yeah. <laughs> but um you know and that's what and that's what the times were like. In fact it's kind of funny. The the most out the uh, the reviewers have stated that the, some of the few of the things mostly having to do with the, the uh the um, the manager and his drug dealing issues. Mm-hmm. I say, well, this just seems implausible, and we're... that was a true one. <laughs> the <laughs> things they find the most outrageous and implausible are the things that were true, and the things I actually made up are the things that that they find the most plausible. Mm-hmm. So you know, and finally, what I'd like to end up with because we've talked about a diversity of different ways that you can take a look at the music business from the 1960s and 1970s, especially through the eyes of groups that a lot of people are familiar with. How much longer do we think the Who is going to keep going? Oh, but they're such a great. I mean, you know, well, there's not much left of them anymore. Yeah, they're half of the band. Now. Well, what, I mean, that Who's next album is just a classic. It's one mm-hmm. of the best. I think one of the best albums of all time. There's just, you know, when I found out, I don't know if you realize this. I read a thing on that on that album originally, and I and I always wonder why they called that song Baba O'Reilly. Mm-hmm. That was originally going to be a big rock opera, like Tommy, or like. Right. Um, the other one, I never knew that. Quadrophenia. Quadrophenia. Right. But uh, that was, and that's why the song's called Baba O'Reilly. That was a character. But I mean, that's just such great stuff. And but they still are performing, and they're still. In fact, they just did a show, whatever's left of them, recently. I saw them just when um, what's his name died. Mm-hmm. Um, Keith Moon or John Entwistle? No, Entwistle died. Okay. And in fact, it was the weekend they were doing a concert in L.A. That weekend, Entwistle died, I think, on a Friday. And the concert was on Saturday or Sunday. They're going to cancel it, and they said, "No, we're going to go do it." They found a bass player to fill in, and um, th- they were just still phenomenal. But you know, they're just a great band alive, and I've seen them so many times over the years. I mean, they're just a great band. I mean, mm-hmm. they just you know, what can you do? I mean, they're not not everything they did was great, but that was kind of the way. Mm-hmm. That's I think the other problem with the record companies now: people don't buy albums with little fillers. They only mm-hmm. buy the single now. Right. And so it's really hard to put an album. Remember in the old days, you bought an album, and 
there was you know one, two, maybe three great songs on. The rest of it was filler, but it was still a great you know good album. Well, the other thing too, Stephen, about that is that's what I've even told my wife uh, as she's kind of beginning to enjoy uh, over the years being with me rock and roll as I introduce her to different aspects, and she's like, "Wow, this is a lot better than I would have thought it would be," you know, but. That uh, I said there was a time, even in the classic rock station that we have up here in the Northwest, as I was, uh, you know, growing up, that they would play usually at least up to four songs on a new album. They would just rotate, you know, three or four songs. So by then you had a really good taste that compelled you to want to run out there besides just the number one hit. Right. And the other thing, too, is I was talking with uh, Tom Petty some years ago, he was really kind of disconcerted as well about how the music business had changed to where they were saying, what we really want you to do is to do a best of. Uh, we don't really want any new songs on that. And he says, you know, what he loved doing was making albums. He only wanted to do album contracts. And obviously he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> well, and, and, and especially for someone like Tom Petty, who's such a prolific songwriter. Exactly. I mean, that's his thing. Right. I mean, there are groups that have to do cover songs and things like that, but Tom Petty's forte, I think, is his songwriting ability. Mm -hmm. Why would he not want to write songs? Right. Good, bad, or whatever. Maybe they're not going to sell anymore. Maybe, But that's his thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many of them that, that you know, they, they used to, I think the... I, I don't think there is too many, and we in the old days, remember, we used to have album-oriented radio? Right. They wouldn't just play the single. Well, that's now what I was talking about, is you'd hear three or four songs, maybe and, five even, yeah. go, geez, I really want that now, you know. Exactly. Now all they play is the single to death, and, mm -hmm. and you know, that's what's going to sell, and that's what's going to do well. They don't have the album-oriented radio like they used to have. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't, I mean, maybe I don't punch in the right radio stations, I don't know, but... I think that album oriented radio has kind of gone by the wayside. There's not yeah. too many of them out there, but there's some. There are some great groups out there. My my, my new great great group that I've been listening to is a, a group by the name of Grace Potter and the Nocturnals. A great band. Check them out. Mm -hmm. Will do. It's been a real pleasure to have you here on the program and take the amazing journey back to the 1960s and 70s and to discover what it is in the music business that probably a lot of us don't see. It's certainly much more than American Idol. <laughs> yeah, and, but see, man, I I love American Idol. Right. I watch it to death, and only because I keep my ears going. And I and I usually have to say, "Oh, he's flat. Oh, he's sharp. Oh, that was the wrong song. Oh, that was no emotion. Oh, no feeling. You know this. You know, I have it keeps it keeps me current. It keeps whatever. But it also mm -hmm. introduces new artists. Yeah. And that and they and they need somewhere to introduce new artists nowadays. So I think that it that has its own thing. You know, some I like and some I don't like. Usually the ones that I like, I mean, I thought Daughtry was a huge hit. Look, he was. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they pick the wrong songs, but I think those those shows are, are good for a certain for that audience. But, yeah, well, there's, a, there's a lot of different things out there. But, yeah, it's been a pleasure being on. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. You bet. And if you're going to have perseverance, study the who. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Stephen, thank you so much you for being on the program. everything. Thank you so much. We also want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Again, the book is Hollywood, the band, a tale of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Be sure to get a copy. I think you'll enjoy the amazing journey. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you again for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past half-life.